Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening, the opportunity to look into your word and to have you look into our hearts and reveal them to us. Lord, we pray for that in this time, that you will touch each of us with what we need to hear, certainly not what I'm saying, but what you're saying and what your word is saying to each of us. And that can be very different. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be together. Thank you most of all for the love you've shown us in Jesus Christ and we pray in his holy name. Amen. <laughs> Almost said his humble name for no particular reason, but I guess that's true too. He humbled himself to come for us. Alright, tonight we're going to finish up James. And as I usually like to do, I'm going to read the whole chapter and then we'll go back and break it down verse by verse. That way you can get to hear more of the Bible and less of me, which is important. But uh, this was an interesting study preparing for it because I first started with the wrong elder schedule which showed me doing 1 Peter 1. I got halfway through that and then someone rattled my cage and said, aren't you supposed to be in James? I said, I thought we finished James. And then I looked at the old schedule which had uh, 1 Peter 1 on for night, so I wasn't totally crazy. But then I looked at the newest provision, and yep, this was James 5. So I think I taught James 1 a little over a month ago. And for some reason, when I pulled it up, James 1 was in my brain, so I started doing James 1. I did that for about 30 minutes, and this seems awfully familiar. Can this be right? And then I saw the number, and I said, okay, let's start one more time. Here we are, and I finally arrived at James 5. Come now, you rich, weep and wail over the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your clothes have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be evidence against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have stored up treasures in the last days. Behold the wages of the workers who mowed your fields which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts for a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. So be patient, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient for it until it receives the early and late rain. You also be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the coming of the Lord is near. Do not grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the doors. As an example of suffering and patience, Brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider blessed those who show endurance. You have heard of the endurance of Job, and you have seen the outcome of Adonai, that Adonai is full of compassion and mercy. But above all, my dear brothers and sisters, do not swear, either by heaven, or by the earth, or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes, and your no be no, so that you may not fall under judgment. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of Messiah's community, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So confess your offenses to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man is very powerful. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. He prayed again and the sky gave rain. And the earth produced its fruits. My brothers and sisters, if any among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, 
Let him know that the one who turns a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Especially at the beginning, this is not the most encouraging chapter in the Bible. Though there are some that are a lot worse. It is kind of understandable though, why Luther wanted to throw James out. Uh, but God preserved it for a reason. And we're going to see if we can find some of those reasons together tonight. Looking at verses 1 through 3 again. Come now, you rich, weep and wail over the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your clothes have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be evidence against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have stored up treasure in the last days. This one was a real downer for me. Uh, it was not to the point of conviction, because I literally have a little bit of gold and silver stored up for final days. Uh, I did take heart in the fact that gold doesn't rust. That's one of its properties. And while silver, silver does oxidize, it's not really rust. It's not what we usually look at as rust, which is when iron oxidizes. Of course, it is in the Bible, so it must be true that God could easily turn silver and gold into iron and then rust it, or He could just turn it straight into rust. So I can't argue against that one. Now, if you don't own any precious metals, you aren't off the hook. The definition of a rich man in, in the Greek speaks to all who have an abundance, and they hold on to it rather than being generous. I am being a little facetious here, but this is very serious, and it really does apply to everyone here. We live in the richest nation in the world, and all of us have an abundance. And if we are holding on to it greedily, then we are the ones that are being described here in this section. Now, God does allow us, allow for us, and He gives us the opportunity to prosper. That is a problem. We are encouraged throughout the Bible to be industrious. What God doesn't allow without painful consequences is what we're talking about here. And it's greed, it's a lack of compassion, a lack of generosity towards others. Let's look at verses 4 through 6. Behold, the wages of the workers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your heart for a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Okay, on the little literal front here, I'm a little better off. I don't remember defrauding any workers. I very rarely had any employees that I could defraud, so that's a plus. I'm reasonably certain I've never murdered a defenseless, righteous man, though I have in the, my past committed fraud, theft, most of it distant past, thankfully. Um, and I have considered murdering a few unrighteous men in my day, but that's never happened. But we really are looking at here, again, not the literal, but we're talking about matters of the heart and where we think we should be. And I'm a little closer to conviction, even though I'm not as guilty in this section, but I still have the resistance. And I am talking about me because it isn't my place to talk about you guys, or to convict you, or to condemn you. And it's not your place to convict or condemn me. That task belongs strictly to the Holy Spirit. If you are not self-evaluating when you read this or any passages like that, and if you're thinking of others and what you know your wife should be doing, the, be in line with this, or, you know, I know this is talking about 
Joe have seen him doing it, then you are painfully close to being the person that this is addressing. We need to look at our own sins, our own faults, and recognize them, claim them, ask forgiveness for them, and do all we can to stop doing these things. And we are only able to do that through turning to God, relying on the Holy Spirit for that. Verses 7 and 8. So be patient, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Being patient for it, be patient for it only that. Being patient for it until it receives the early and late rain. You also be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the coming of the Lord is near. Finally, we have some encouraging words here. And Jacob Yaakov, I have Jacob in here a lot because James in the Hebrew would be Jacob. James is the Greek version. It also happens to be my name. And since I started with next week first, we're going to talk about the name some next week. Just know if I say Jacob or Yaakov, I'm talking about James. And he is advising us of two things here. To be patient and to strengthen our hearts. There is a common thing here that I see and struggle with all the time. And I see it everywhere. Which I think is pretty much means it is something for God. And it's been a struggle more for me lately than it has for quite a while. And that thing is and actually, I was going to say this, uh, often when I am brought up here to teach, I am going through something in God's infinite sense of humor that He is having me teach me. You guys will hear what you're supposed to from the Spirit. But I did get greatly convicted by this about my attitude in the last few weeks. And that's what we're looking at here. But that thing that I'm talking about and what he needs me to hear again, yet I talk about it all the time, is our choice of focusing on what's eternal or what's, on, what's temporal. What's of the kingdom of God and what's of the world. There's any number of ways to put it, and we see it in different ways in the Bible. But that is our struggle against flesh, against spirit. Which one's going to win out? You've probably heard the old saw about the dog that wins the fight is when you feed the most. So if we're feeding, feeding the spiritual and trying to starve the flesh, we will lead towards the spiritual on the continuum there. And our focus is the whole point there. Are we focusing on God? <laughs> Or are we focusing on us? Patience is easy if we are recognizing that God is working things out in His way and in His timing. And we can't miss any of those. We can say, well, God's working this out and here's what you need to do, God, next Tuesday. That's not how it works. He's doing it in His time. And He is taking us through it for a reason. So we need to recognize that the trials are there for a purpose. We are often told in the Bible to be patient and wait on the Lord. That's great advice. But why is it so difficult? Well, verse 5 gives us one hint. Because we seek luxury and self-indulgence. We're looking for our own comfort and our own desires. In the Rams Heart Ministry, where I'm involved, and I normally, I'm not here on Tuesdays, it's not because I don't love you, but unless I'm teaching, I'm there working on the, a radio program that plays Saturday mornings. We often refer to this 
as living in the smaller story instead of living in God's epic story. We are part of God's story. We are important, an important part of God's story. But as soon as we turn it into our story, we get into trouble and into the flesh. And that is basically focusing on ourself instead of God and all others. I was sitting waiting for my wife who went to a new dentist today in the lobby. And the TV was on and that was some women's talk show. And the, whoever, the, I don't even know people that do that anymore, but whoever was leading it asked the audience if it is selfish to think of yourself first. And in one voice, they all said no. And me sitting in the audience in the TV room with five or six others around me said loudly, yes, that's the definition of selfish, is putting ourselves first. And one lady looked at me and smiled and everybody else ignored me. But it was just, it came out in that moment. And our culture is telling us that we do need to seek our own first. And then we can help others. So that really is a how it works. And you'll hear that in church. It's put in a much kinder, gentler way. But, you, know, you can't love others until you love yourself. Have you heard that? Well, I think the Bible verse there is focused on we do love ourselves. We're all into taking care of ourselves. We need to see others as more important than ourselves. But ultimately, patience, strength, and all good things come from focusing on God. And that's the theme in James, and it's the theme throughout the Bible. Verses 9 through 11. Do not grumble against one another, brother and sister, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the doors. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spake, spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider blessed those who showed endurance. You have heard of the endurance of Job. You have seen the outcome of Adonai, that Adonai is full of compassion and mercy. No grumbling, or we're judged for it. Has anybody here grumbled this week, this month, today? I am as up one time, not as an example, because I've grumble regularly. And so once again, God brought me here to teach this because he wanted to talk to me about it. The grumbling is because, once again, we're focused on ourselves and what's not going right in our life. Or what we see is going wrong in somebody we care about. And we grumble about those things. But again, that is taking the focus off of God and what he's, a, he's able to do rather than focusing on ourselves. And that does account for all sins. Many years ago, I decided there was really only one sin, and that's pride. That's the original sin of Lucifer. That's what we got him thrown out of heaven. And it real, you can trace pretty much any sin back to pride. And we think of pride and we see signs. You know, be proud of this, be proud of that. Not the same word. This pride is a matter of my will, my desire over anybody else's, including God's. That's the pride that led to the fault, both of Lucifer and of Adam. And that's the fall we deal with every day. So you can be proud of your children and the people that God gave them to you, but recognize that's God's doing, not yours. Alrighty. In this, I really love verse 10. And I actually use the concept you see there often. Both when I'm becoming overwhelmed 
by stuff of the world in my life and when I talk to others who feel overwhelmed by their circumstances. And it really addresses things well. And uh, I'll use some of my recent time as an illustration. Last Friday, our water heater sprung a leak and was making noises. And I was able to turn off the water so that we didn't have a flood on top of it. But I've had a lot of financial snafus lately. And having no hot water and they suddenly, suddenly having a $1,200 bill to, to add into that mix, I was feeling a bit overwhelmed, to put it mildly. And I was living in my small story in that. What happens when I look at it from a kingdom perspective? If I consider the persecution of the prophets, which is what this is saying here, and not just the prophets, the disciples, the person writing this, the brother of Jesus, suffered a violent death because of his beliefs. We look at Jesus himself. What did he have to endure? What did he have to suffer for? A $1,200 slap in the face has no significance in the context of what others have gone through for Christ. And that gets you back into the epic story that God has for us. Then the, well, the, one other thing in that story is I had trouble getting hold of another plumber. I got this guy the $1,200 bill that I had to pay. If I had just about anybody else do it, it would have been $2,000 according to Carson. I decided not to pick on you this time. I flip flop, so I'm not trying to get crazy. But, you know, there are blessings in that difficult time. God brings them around. And John reminds us here at the end of this little section of God's love and mercy. Everything God does for us, and sometimes we think to us, is out of His love and mercy and grace. Alrighty. And in that place, in the love and mercy of God, is where we find the power and the blessing. Uh, of endurance, which is spoken to in this section. Verse 12 stands alone, and it is often quoted. That's what we're going to read next. It's kind of the center of this text and the theme tonight. But above all, my dear brothers and sisters, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no so that you may not fall under judgment. My first reaction to this, earlier we talked about, you know, swindling workers and, and killing righteous men. And the but above all here grabbed my attention in a big way. It's a, you know, occasional swearing in, in the big deal. <coughs> it is, because this speaks to integrity basically what we need to have and be if we are God's children. We can't do those other things because we need the integrity of having our yeses be yeses and our noes be noes. Again, referring to the other ministry, we, all, we have an entire section on being a poser. And I know I brought that up in here before. But so often, we're, we're not only not being transparent, we're putting on a face that we want others to see and believe about us that we know is not true. It's common to find the more insistent someone is about making a point, swearing that this is so, the more they insist on that, the more likely they are being deceptive in whole or in part the more emotion we see people put into a cause, often there's something else going on there rather than just having a yes or no. So that goes much deeper than saying yes when you mean yes, saying no when you mean no. 
and addresses our total integrity, our ability to communicate things in a way that we are being representatives of God. Spin, misleading, exaggerating, adding things to our speech is all of the enemy. So don't do it. As Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36, we are held responsible for every idle word that we speak. Well, idle just means basically worthless. How much more are we held responsible for? lies, deception, even spin, putting something in a better light than it belongs in. All of those are part of the yes, yes, and no, no. Verses 13 to 15. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the Silas community and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And this is one of the places we go to that we see that in the Bible very plainly and we do it here. We anoint with oil. And I jumped in too quick because I didn't have that earlier. I lost my place. All right, let's see. The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. This list, short list, in verses 13 and 14, could be a lot longer. But there are three things missing. And it really is another view of taking our circumstances the temporal and responding in the internal. I'm not going to make any big assumptions here, but did you notice there are two negatives, suffering and sick, and illness in the body and soul, but there's only one positive, which is being cheerful. I don't know if that ratio is the frequency we're going to encounter sorrow and joy. That's a bit of a stretch, and I don't like putting things in the scripture that aren't there. But I do find it somewhat revealing that it's a two for one ratio there. That's how I've, I haven't felt like my ratio has been that good lately, but it really has. I mean, so much of what's going on that I'm anxious about is good stuff. It also may be that we need more support in the time of illness. And again, illness here can be physical, emotional, financial, or spiritual. It's not just having cancer. Things to think about there. Verse 15 is very deep in the layers and we're only going to skin it a little bit. But at the surface, it is encouragement. It's also an assignment of duties. Our requirement is praying in faith for those that are sick, which at some level is everyone. We're all sick in this world. It's God's place to raise us up, to raise them up. Despite the implication that faithful prayer saves the sick, it is only God who raises them up and redeems them. The prayer is important for us and for them. But God is the one that completes the deal. This is true regardless of whether the sickness is physical, emotional, financial, or spiritual. I find the wording of the last sentence to be very interesting. It says, if we sin, we will be forgiven by God. This is triggered by faithful prayer. But it is an if, it's when. All of us are still sinners. All of us are going to need that lifting up and need to lift one another up. 
And I singled out verse 16, and it's a verse most of us, if not all of us, would like to edit a little bit. So confess your offenses to one another and pray for one another, so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man is very powerful. I think most of us would like to scratch the first sentence there and just say effective prayer of a righteous person is very powerful. And I know we've all seen this first, or at least heard it, heard the concept of confessing our sins one to another. How many of us have someone we trust enough to do that with regularly? I'm almost tempted to ask for a show of hands. I don't expect to see me, and I need to put my down. I don't regularly. How many of us have even tried it? You know, don't need to show it, but have you tried confessing to someone else? Now, I'm not really talking about confessing a wrong you've done to someone, where you confess you did it, you ask for forgiveness, and you apologize. That's not what it's talking about here. It's more about, you know, I robbed a liquor store last week, and I won't tell you about it because it was wrong and I recognize it. I didn't. But that's an example. It's taking something to someone else and being vulnerable. And again, having the integrity and the transparency of doing the right thing and trusting the person you're with. I'm definitely not talking about the formalized, ordained process that we see in the Catholic Church of confessing to a priest. Though within the context of this verse, that isn't necessarily a bad idea, but it says very clearly in this verse that it's one to another, brother to brother, not, I don't even know, well, we'll just make it priest to I'll say subject, I can't think of a better word, but it's almost what it is. There isn't a hierarchy in God's kingdom other than God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and then the rest of us. That's all we'll say about that. Do you know anyone that regularly seeks out a fellow believer to confess their offenses? And honestly, it's just as difficult to listen as it is to share your problems. Uh, I have something that approaches that once a week, but more often we are silly and having fun, not confessing, but there is that level of trust that we do that. And something that's rampant in our group is pornography. I'll use that as an example. How many, if you struggle with that, and I did years ago, and I lost interest in being an old man, but I'm sure if I was 30 years younger, that would still be a big struggle. And yeah, when the, something comes on the TV and we're watching it together, and there's a naked female, or a partially naked female, we don't see any full ones, but every once in a while there's a glimpse. Every once in a while that happens, I'm pretty slow peeling my eyes away. I usually do, but that will always be a temptation if we're, I guess we're heterosexual, sexual males, but the temptation isn't the problem, it's our response to it. And that is something that is a struggle for any folks. That, I would bet that half the guys in this room still have a problem with that. Because that's the statistics. Maybe a third of us. Because we're better than the rest of those guys out there, right? That we all have something abiding in us that we want to get rid of. And when you do confess something like that, you are actually regaining your power over it or diminishing its power over you. So this is a, a good concept. It's been adulterated because we do that with pretty much all the good stuff in the Bible. We take it, make it our own, and mess it up. But we miss out 
by not having that as part of our process of being healed. We go back up and look at it. It says that, well, I lost my verses. I got new glasses today. I thought I'm doing better, but I can't focus quite as well. But anyway, it talks about there that our healing comes, at least in part, from the confessing to one another. And we miss that part because there's so few times we do it, even if that is a practice. And that's a good practice to have. You find somebody you trust and do it. Can you think of a better way to shine a light on a dark place in your life that needs healing? Is there a place that needs this in your life? Think about that. I'm not going to ask you to do exactly that tonight, but something close. We do live comfortably behind our masks. And we don't want to risk the alienation that will certainly come if we step out and we become transparent. Does anybody in here think that our brothers in here would love us if they really knew everything about us? They might believe that they would be loved by the others if we knew everything. I don't see any hands. None of us, we know ourselves. We know what we're capable of. We know where we've fallen. We don't want others to know that. And that is, I, I suspect anybody that can say that has a mental illness. I'm not joking about that. All of us have that feeling that we can't be real or people will judge us and reject us. And it seems clear to me that is exactly what Yaakov is saying we need to do in order to be healed, is to reveal ourselves. Think about that for a moment and then we'll move on. Reading 17 to 20. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. He prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. My brothers and sisters, if any among you strays from the truth, and someone turns him back, let him know that the one who turns a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Now, the Elijah portion of this is really, a, for me, a non sequitur. And why is that tucked in the middle of all this wisdom James was sharing? And how we should live. But two things in that portion really stand out to me. First, he is described as a man like us. This is arguably the, well, second greatest prophet in the Old Testament because Elisha wanted a double portion of Elijah and God gave it to him. But one of the great prophets of the Old Testament was a man like us. Yeah, I know the fellow saying that is the brother of Jesus and he's pretty impressive too, but both of them are saying this because that's any and all of us. It's not special people that have that strength. It's just special people, which can be all of us, that surrender totally to God and let Him display that strength in us. Alrighty. We are all part, including Elijah James, of the same fallen nature. We all struggle with the same things. The second thing is we also all have access to the same power of God. And that comes through prayer. So what stops us from tapping into that power? We go back to the theme of the selfishness and pride. That's a big part of it. If we are focused on us, our prayers are heard, they're answered, but we're not going to have the impact on others that we could if we're surrendered. And the more surrendered we are, the more power God will display through us. 
One of the sadder verses in the Bible, and one I live in all too often, is one, or more precisely, one and a half that you studied last week, if you were here. James 4, the last part of 2 and verse 3. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, so you may spend it on your passions. I That was the most convicting thing, it wasn't in tonight's, but it, God took me back to it. I do that. Even when I'm praying for others, you know, I, I'll pray, Carolyn gets over a cold, because I don't want to get sick, and I don't want her to feel bad because I love her. But still, something of a selfish prayer. Elijah, in this prayer, he did not ask for his own sake. In fact, that would be against the nature, particularly in an agricultural society, to want rain to stop for three and a half years. That's rough on everybody, everybody he cared about. But he did it according to God's will. And God was glorified in this. And idolatry was, well, it was never destroyed in the land, but greatly diminished the power of it, with the loss of, loss of those evil priests. He made a huge impact for God by doing what God told him to do. And, and that's really all it was, it's the obedience that he did in God. Not really compared, even though it's PD. Alrighty. So, well, how do we know what to pray? My biggest struggle, even when I'm praying for others, is how should I pray for this person? Uh, when it's physical, our first impulse is almost always for physical healing. But sometimes the best physical healing, not always, the best physical healing is physical death and going to be with Jesus. So I've always, on that one, from when I first went into the hospital, my prayer was always for God's will and for everyone involved to grow closer to one another and closer to God. If you ever visit with me in the hospital, here's some version of that. We don't always know what we should be praying, even when we are seeking to pray in a godly way and without any personal interest there. There's one easy answer to that, and once again, it's something I rarely pursue. We often should start by asking God to show us what we ought to pray for, and then pray for that. And we can always pray, and this too is biblical, that the Holy Spirit will intercede on our behalf in ways we can't even understand. Because we want to join in God's will and His purpose when we're praying. I'm going to reread 19 and 20 again, because it's a glorious end to a convicting chapter, and just because I like it. My brothers and sisters, if any among you strays from the truth and someone turns them back, let him know that the one who turns a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. To do this, to go after a brother or sister who's fallen, requires risk and transparency. But it's a task that has obvious benefits to the other person and rewards to us by confronting someone who's straying. If we can help them back, it does cover a multitude of sins. Now, Jesus has covered all our sins. Don't take that wrong. But it's a lot easier for God to bless us and to use us if this is our heart, to help others and to step out. If we don't charge into the battle, we're not going to become heroes. This, this, is, this part actually is just talking about believers, 
But we also need to present the good news to the lost. And we want to pray for the Holy Spirit to convict them and draw them into the sheepfold. We can't beat people up until they come into the kingdom. Our only requirement is to present the gospel, the good news, that Jesus died for them, and let God work with them from that point. Asking them to pray the prayer of salvation is fine. That's part of that. But if they're not ready, don't push it. Because God will make them ready. Or they will stay in their pride and selfishness. And they will get what they want. Which is to be left alone by God. And that's really what hell is. Okay. Both going after the lost and after the lost sheep is a risky act of love. But it does have eternal consequences. It carries through to the kingdom. And those consequences are for everyone involved, both ourselves and for those that we've helped. Again, Jesus' blood covers all of our sins. But our love for others shows that we received and responded to his love. So let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this night. We thank you that you came after us, and that was risky, because you put your heart on the line to rescue our hearts, our bodies, our souls, our everything. You showed us what love is, and you invited us to accept your love and to reflect it to others. And Lord, that is what we want to do. And to do that, we need to be real, is another way to put it. We need to be transparent. We need to put down the masks. And there's some people that we do need to be guarded against. Lord, may that never be our brothers and sisters in Christ. Help us to forgive one another, to confess to one another, to love one another with the kind of love that you've shown us by leaving heaven, coming down, and dying at the hands of men so that men can be saved. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we pray in the name and the power according to your will. And we ask for your Holy Spirit to guide us all.